I always worry when the introduction is better than the talk. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Shuklawit. Aloha pa. Greetings in some of the languages of the Yakima Valley. I'd like to talk with you tonight about what I believe is one of the most vital and challenging issues affecting our country today, the elimination of racial prejudice and the recognition of the oneness of humanity. And I'd also like to share some stories from a program that I developed to help translate this vision into reality and action. We live in troubled times. Our society seems to be more fractured and polarized by the day. Our entire world has never been more divided by race, religion, class, nation, and yet, at the same time, we've never had more potential for unity. For the first time in human history, we can see a photograph of our planet as one home. We can fly to any spot on the Earth in a single day. We can talk with anyone, anywhere, in an instant. We walk upon the same ground. We breathe the same air. Isn't it time to recognize that we are one human race? Have you ever met a racist baby? Of course not. Prejudice is not genetic, it's something that we're taught. And that gives me hope, because if we can learn it, we can unlearn it. We can pass laws against discrimination and hate, but in order to see real change, we need to change hearts. This is my story. These two got together and produced me. I know, I used to be cute. <laughs> I had no choice as to whether I wanted to be black or white, tall or short, male or female. They didn't even ask. And I suspect many of you had a similar experience. <laughs> we come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. We speak different languages. We have different cultures, different religious beliefs. But science has confirmed that we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA. Say that number with me, 99.9%. .9 and look at what we've done with that other 0.1. Some people think that we are different races because we have different skin colors. While it's true that some of us have very dark skin and some of us have very light skin, if we only look at the extremes of the skin color spectrum, our eyes are deceived into seeing separate races. But there is no skin color border. We come in a continuum of hues and shades. Let's take a look at our family tree, and this is the generations going back in time. Let's start with Maria. Maria has two parents. How many grandparents? Four great-grandparents? Keep going, 16, 32, 64, 128, uh-oh. <laughs> Not too many mathematicians in the audience. Okay, a person's ancestral lineage is an exponential function, which means that we're not adding to each generation back, we're not adding to each time, we're multiplying by two, which means that number going back is going to get really large very quickly. Okay, this is Amir. Amir has two parents, four grandparents, etc., all the way back. What's going to happen to these two family trees if you go far, far enough back in time? Exactly, they're going to intersect at some point back. Assuming now that we have no shared ancestors, each person has a completely separate family tree. If we count back 40 generations, which is about a thousand years, each one of us, each person in this room, would have about a trillion ancestors. Think about that number now. 
Here's the math, and for those who are interested, I won't leave this slide up for very long, but if you're interested, it's out, it'll be out in the hall after the, after the show. <laughs> and how many people are alive on the earth today? Close. Almost 8 billion. Almost 8 billion people. It's around 7.7. Tomorrow it may be 7.8. Were there more people or fewer people in the past? Exactly, a whole lot fewer. In fact, 10,000 years ago, there were only about 5 million people on the planet. Now think about this. If every single person in this room, if every single person on the planet had a trillion ancestors and there were no overlap, how is this even possible? Not, right? The only way is we are all related. In fact, the Human Genome Project tells us that at the very least, every single person on the planet is at least 50th cousins. And some of us are a whole lot closer than that. So turn to both sides and say hello to your cousin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, enough cousinhood. <laughs> I believe that the key to unity and to overcoming prejudice is the recognition of the oneness of humanity. And if you take nothing from this presentation tonight, take, if you take one thing, take this. There is no us or them. It's all us. <laughs> now, as you can tell, I'm quite passionate about this topic, and that is why four years ago I decided to establish a nonprofit foundation, and that is Unity Works. The mission is to reduce prejudice, to promote cross racial and cross cultural understanding, equity, and inclusion with a focus on K 12 schools. We work with teams of educators offering training educational resources, and ongoing support. I feel that a team approach is critical because it helps to ensure accountability, maintain focus. If you just have one person working on an issue, that person's sick, or they change their mind, or they move, or whatever, it disappears. But if you have a team, you have the possibility of sustaining that effort. And I require the teams from each school to have at least four people. One is an administrator, usually a principal or an assistant principal. And then the second person is a teacher, so we have representation from different stakeholders. The third is a parent or a community representative. And the fourth can be any person of their choice. And many times schools will choose a librarian or a counselor. And if the team is at a high school level, then students can also be part of that team. The program is designed to build capacity at the grassroots, empowering each team to create its own blueprint for change. And what that means is, I don't walk into a school and say, hi, I'm the expert, I know everything, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with your school, this is what you need to do to fix it, here's a set curriculum, I'm going to come back and check up on you at the end of the year. No. What UnityWorks provides is some training, some tools, some strategies, some ideas, things that other schools have learned or developed that you might be able to adapt for your own use, and then you put together your plan based on your needs and your priorities. And then people have ownership, and they get excited, and it belongs to them. Involvement in the program begins with a five-day training designed to prepare those teams with the knowledge, strategies, tools, resources that they need to develop a successful diversity action plan. And then at the end of the school year, we bring the teams together for a conference where they have an opportunity to network, share best practices, and sometimes plan collaborative projects for this coming school year. I feel this network of teams is critical because it creates a learning community of like-minded people who can offer resources, support, share ideas, especially talking about culture change, especially when you're talking about issues of race, gender, language, diversity. Uh, there's a lot of resistance, and that larger community provides that almost like a nest, a, a circle of support. 
I'd like to share examples from three of the schools in, that have participated in the program. The first is from an elementary school. Their Unity Works team went through the week-long training, and on the final day, they hadn't come up with their diversity action plan. And I said, that's okay. Your plan can be to create a plan. Small steps, that's fine. And they looked back, and no they noted that during the previous school year, there had been an increasing number of incidents of racial bias. Name-calling, bullying, students, calling, students using the N-word, and it was getting worse. They knew they had to address the problem, but they didn't know how, until the first day of school. The principal said she was outdoors in the schoolyard. There were two girls talking in front of her, and one said to the other, my parents won't let me play with you anymore because you're the color of poop. The team decided to focus their plan on skin color. They used a number of activities from my book on teaching unity, where kids learn about where we get our skin color, why we have different skin colors, the role of melanin as a natural sunscreen, and for their final project, they painted self-portraits using accurate skin colors. First, the Unity Works team painted their portraits and posted those up on the wall outside the office. Next, they had all of the teachers work with all of their students to paint their portraits, and they posted up, those up in the hallways outside the school. Look at those beautiful faces. <laughs> then, something amazing happened. The principal said, the very next day, there was not one incident of racial bias. And there hasn't been one since, she said. Not one. What happened? Every single kid felt validated for exactly who they were. Every single student was included. Every color was good. It was posted on the wall of their school. And a lot of the kids brought their parents in to show them their faces up on the wall. And friends, all it cost was $100 for multicultural paint. The second example comes from one of the middle schools. Concerned that only five parents had participated in anything at all during the previous school year, they decided to set their goal of increasing parental involvement. They decided to learn about their own local cultures, the cultures of the students and the staff in that school. Staff, students, and parents worked together in teams to prepare a year-end cultural celebration. And each month, they met once a month all together, the teams grew in size and excitement until parent involvement reached over 450 people for their culminating activity in one school year. That is incredible, and this was their plan. I could just sit back and applaud. <laughs> well done. The third example comes from one of the high schools, and this was in response to talk in our community against Muslims, immigrants, and other groups. And so the Unity Works team decided to focus their action plan on teaching students directly about stereotyping and prejudice. So they brought in a play on the Japanese internment, and this play was called Nihonjin Face, which means Japanese face. And friends, that was the only reason that people were removed from their homes, rounded up, and sent to basically prison. At the end of the play, the actors took off their costumes, came out on the stage, looked at the audience of students, staff, and parents who were gathered there, and led a very powerful discussion based on these three questions. Why were people taken from their homes and imprisoned? Could something like this happen today? And what can you do about it? The reason I like to work with educators and schools is the multiplier effect. I might be able to reach 100 people with a message of unity. But if I reach 100 teachers, each one of them can reach thousands of students over the course of a career. Now, if you look at this guy, he's looking a little bit skeptical, right? <laughs> and one of the most exciting things to me is to watch the transformation of the adults who come through our training. 
Usually it's the white males who are sitting in the back of the room. Their arms are crossed, not making eye contact. They might have a newspaper up in front of their face. And their whole body language is telling me, oh, there's a plant behind me, sorry. Their whole body language is saying, I already know what you're going to say. I'm not interested. I'm the guilty one. I'm the oppressor. Racism, sexism, it's all my fault. Go away. Right? And so I have this rule. No white male bashing. And when they hear that, the newspaper comes down, the shoulders relax a little bit. On day two, they're leaning in. By day three, they're actively participating in all of the groups. And by the end of the, of the training session, they're up in the front of the room saying, my eyes have been opened. It's a paradigm shift. I can't wait to get back to my campus and make some changes in the way we do things around here. Another exciting transformation happens on day three of our training when we talk about race. At the beginning of the day, in the morning, I'll pass out three by five cards and ask everyone to write down a number. How many races are there? Then we collect the cards, redistribute them randomly, and I ask people to read the number that they have on their cards. So it's completely anonymous. The most common number that people write down is five. Black, white, red, yellow, brown. And then someone will say, well, what about Polynesians? Oh, okay, there's six. What about Arabs? Okay, there's seven. But what about, and some of the numbers are like 38, or 75, or 181, and sometimes the numbers are in the thousands. Very rarely does anybody put one. On the last, at the end of the day, when people leave the room, and I feel fairly confident about this, Every single person leaves knowing that we are one human race. And that's a foundation on which we can build. I'd like to close with a few thoughts. What will our world look like when all children are raised without prejudice? When the enormous treasure wasted on war is spent on education and science the elimination of poverty and disease, when force is made the servant of justice, when all members of our human family live together in peace. I don't know what that world will look like, and I might never see it, but Gandhi says, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. You must be the change. And so I'd like to leave you with a challenge and I'd like you to think of something that you can do this week or this month that will widen the circle of who you call us. Widen the circle. It might mean inviting someone new out to coffee. It might mean standing up for someone who's been pushed aside. And I'd like you to write it down so you don't forget, or take out your phone and put it in your calendar. And can you imagine if every single person in this room did something to promote unity? What a ripple effect we would have in our town. So I'd like to close with this question. What if all the children in the world were born without prejudice? Answer? They are. Thank you. <laughs> I get to ask you a question. Oh, sure.